cause us to have understanding today, Lord God, that we will grow, Lord, that knowledge that is already in us, that you will cause us to continuously remember what we've been taught over the last few weeks and that that will be playing in the background of what you will do today. And Father, we thank you that our slates are clean, Lord God, that we are agreeing that we will lay down any ideas that we have, any thoughts that we have about where we're going with this message and we will listen and we will hear and we will build and we will begin to align our lives, God, with where you want us to be individually because the church is not just an institution, a building we show up to on Sunday mornings. Lord, that is just the outward place. That's the place where we go for our education sometimes, but Lord, is not where we rest everything in. And Father, we thank you more than anything that we are your temple, that our worship, our praise, our understanding, everything that we need for life and godliness is resting on the inside of us. So your sanctuary, God, is supposed to be us and our sanctuary is supposed to be you. So we're trusting you to cause this to be clear to us today. And Father, we thank you that our faith and our belief is not predicated on a human, is not predicated on um, anything outward that a person would bring into our houses, is predicated on our own investment and our own design and our own will, Lord God, towards you in our own way, in Jesus' name. So listen, I wanna thank you for joining me this evening. The series that we're starting right now is called, well, let's go ahead and record. Give me, um, yes, we're already recording. So listen, what we're doing right now is talking about part one, church modification versus church transformation. And we're going to approach this in pieces and in parts. So what you're going to see me do today is just lay a little bit of groundwork and a little foundation. And I'm gonna bring you into a new question about your fire. I'm like, might be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with fire? Because the truth of the matter is, if we're burning for God, if we're really in pursuit of him, there are times in our lives, listen, when the Lord himself, and I want you to hear this. If we're pouring ourselves closer and closer to him, if we're really in that hot pursuit, if we're really in that thirsty place, if we're really able to touch the hem of his garment in our own lives, I'm telling you right now that there is no way he will leave you in any fallen state that you are in. It's absolutely impossible for that to be true. So wherever we find ourselves, if we find ourselves on this low spectrum where one is where we are, I wanna tell you right now that that pursuit has to increase. I want to tell you that you have to cast all your care and all your trust on God, because listen, no institution and no person can do that for you. You're sitting here listening to me, but I'm telling you we're all on the same, um, direction when it comes to God. He wants all of us to be in that place of pursuit where we are fully involved in his fire. Listen, overcome by it, it burning in us, it leading us. And we can do that by giving God our yes this morning saying, hey, this is exactly where I want to be, God. And this is exactly what I want to say to you, God, is that I'm all in. If you can do that and mean that with truth, the Lord can meet you. Over the last few weeks, we've seen an increase in pastors that are stepping down from their congregations. They're stepping down and saying, oh, forgive me, I, I had this indiscretion or I made this mistake. They're not naming what they're doing, but they're definitely, definitely coming before the congregation and being found out. We're learning that some of them are being found out, not by a free will of their own, but because they're being threatened with blackmail. People are exposing them online and they can no longer hide. And the scripture tells us that everything done in the dark will be brought to the light, especially on a public platform. If we're on a public platform in a, in a double mind, you can guarantee that most times if you are not repenting quickly that all that you are doing will be brought into a public light god does nothing like that in secret he gives us so many opportunities whether we realize it or not 
to um, turn around. And then there are times when he tells you from the jump, you cannot do this. You cannot walk this way. And that's a fine line for you. And you're not able to do anything because your standard is higher. And so the first time you do it could be your last time breathing. It could be your last time on earth. It could be your last moment, that final opportunity. And so we must begin to look at our lives and decide what we want what we want. I want you to comment in the chat today. I want to see your responses. I thank you for your brutal honesty concerning where you are. There's nobody here that's looking at that and pointing a finger at you because all of us have had meters that we have to stand before God and look at. And for those of you that put five in that, in that space, I just thank God for you because that's where we all need to be. But if you take a moment just know that pastors are falling left and right. Pastors, leaders, apostles, prophets is not gender specific. And I want you to know that these are not just accidents, things that happen. Many of these people that we're finding about has been practicing sin that moved into not just a breach, but a transgression. And then what we've learned about unlawfulness, which is nothing but lasciviousness. They made a conscious choice every day to walk this way. Now, a sin is not just the outward things, those behaviors that we come used, become used to saying, oh, they had an affair. There are all kinds of things. We learned um, some months back that to not pray is a sin. <laughs> we saw that in scripture in the book of Samuel. Samuel said, God forbid if I was sin against you and not pray. So we were able to even see that. So if you're in that place, that's a huge place because that means that there's no rendering or there's no sackcloth and ashes. There's no um, rending your garments unto the Lord, right? So it's so important that we assess ourselves. So there are a couple of instructions I wanna give you real quick. This is a continuation of self-assessment, as Minister Chiquita would say, self-exclavation, -ex as um, Apostle Johnita would say, is self-examination. It's that FaceTime with God every single day, every moment that you're breathing, wanting to be in the right place. So we have a lot of tools. So we know what to do as conservators, but we know it in our heads and in our minds, but not by application. So I want you to see, look real quick, that this slide, you see this gentleman standing here holding, holding the Bible. So we're gonna call him and refer to him as a modern day Paul. So imagine Paul from a 21st century mindset. We're going heavy in scripture today. So I'm gonna ask you to walk with me when we get to some passages. We're gonna exegete really one passage deeply. And I also want you to consider that in the background, we have all of these distractions. We have all of these different voices. You see TikTok, you see Facebook. And I know some of the um, images are mixed up, but listen, this is AI. And it's really appropriate for what we're going to teach today because we're as mixed up as some of these social media symbols are that were translated by AI to this image. But I want you to see and hear that Paul is standing in the middle of all of this and he's telling us we've got to choose a God. And that's what I'm asking you today and demanding of you, you have to choose this day whom you will serve. That's it. <laughs> so we're going to go um, on through our slides. We're gonna go, you already know the copyright notice, so that's gonna be the one you see next. And this time I should add a little AI caveat, but all the images in this presentation are AI. Um, I, they're AI that I created, but they do not belong to me in the sense of that type of originality. But everything else is in the copyright. But here is the slide, and this is where we're going to start. We're going to be looking in depth at the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to get to Acts 17, 24, but for right now, I just want you to open up your scripture. I want you to open up the Bible and with me at Acts 17. And if you have your Bible, I want you to read from um, the New King James or the King James version of the Bible. Okay, so here we go. Are you all ready? Listen, 
So this particular passage of scripture, it shows Apostle Paul, I believe on his second missionary journey. And this is the first time in the history of humanity that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached in this region. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that this was the trip that he decided at some point he was going to go, but then at the last minute, God persuaded him to go and do something else. And so we see him come back later to this particular place, and this is where we find him. Before we dig into this, I want to say this to you. Are we still on this second missionary journey with the Apostle Paul? Are we still here? Because Paul is about to embark on a city with an unknown God. So Acts 17, it begins like this. It says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Now these are cities that Paul is visiting where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now I want you to consider that this synagogue of the Jews is kind of like our church today or any, any place, and I'll say denomination today, or any particular group of people or any place where people believe that they have a revelation about who God is, about who God should be, whether it's the straight and narrow, the gospel we have, or whether it's a denomination that's moved all the way into new age, all the way into universalism, whatever it may be, I want you to just picture this in your holy imagination of Paul walking through this city, but of, of a form of godliness. That's what's happening here. Because remember, he was originally with this synagogue of Jews. So they had a knowledge of God. But also you need to know that in each of these cities, there's a representation of a particular type of God or multiple gods that these people were worshiping. And it says here that Paul in his custom was intent was, um, went into them, and for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. And just so you know, Paul is reasoning with him from the Torah. He's reasoning with them from some of the writings that, that are already circulating, but have not been bound in what we have in our 66 books today. So that imagery is important because these people you're going to see will be receiving the word of God without having as much as has been given to us today. So here is Paul reasoning with them from the scriptures and he's explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And he's saying, this is the Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. This is the Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. I want you to consider how clear this statement is. Paul is saying to them, I have, not, I have not come here with anything else to give you but the message of Jesus and what Jesus has done. So in this place of considering how on fire we are, in this place of considering where we are standing, in this place of knowing that in the congregation today, listen, in the congregation today, we have these huge mega churches and we have these small churches in our communities and pastors and leaders and prophets and apostles are bowing out of the game. They're walking away because of the state of their fallen lives. But I wanna ask you today, what have you been taught about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we so far away from it today that we've forgotten that our, our foundations are shored up here. The prophet Isaiah, he said so plainly to us, he said, if the foundations be destroyed, no, the book of Psalms, it said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I believe it's Psalm 11. That's not on my slides, but I just wanna bring it up because sometimes we teach that passage of scripture wrong, but what that scrap scripture is really saying is this, if the foundations be destroyed, if your trust, if your belief, if your understanding of who God is, that as you were taught in the purity of the faith is destroyed, what can you do? Because I'm here to challenge you today that, listen, many of us were never taught the gospel. We were taught church. We were taught systems. 
we were taught institutions. And as we learned um, this previous week, we learned that a lot of us just entered into how to be good, how to be obedient, how to do the right things, how to make the right decision. Oh, if I'm not smoking a cigarette, then I'm saved. If I'm not fornicating, oh my God, then God is with me. We're looking at those things outwardly instead of inwardly. But here we are on this journey with Paul in Acts 17. And we hear him saying to you, this is whom I preach. I preach Jesus. What does that mean? As you study Paul's doctrine, and there are many places where he says line by line what he teaches, they're learning why Jesus came, you know, why, how Jesus lived. They, they're learning all the things that led to his resurrection and led to our ability to declare in truth that we are resurrected with him. But I, I, I share with you today because I believe without a shadow of a doubt that so much falling is happening in the body, so much discontent in our own walk with the Lord. Sometimes we can't even recognize if we're on fire. Well, we know we're not on fire. We know we're disillusioned. We know our faith has been disrupted. And we have to ask ourselves, listen, do we really know the gospel message? I want you to hear this. Because Paul said this, he said, in some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Because Paul and Silas were walking together arm in arm. They had united their houses for a common purpose. And we've talked about the divided house. We've talked about what that looked like. And at the end of the day, we need to be inside a house or a place where God can dwell. And we need to understand that the only place where that is built is on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, I'm, I'm laying a foundation for something I'm going to close with today and walk you into. And I want you to hear because we're going to have to deal with, listen, church modification, church modification. Verse five, it says, but the Jews who were not persuaded. Now, I want you to consider that for a minute. The Jews knew the scriptures. They knew Torah. They knew Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. They knew the pattern for salvation. They knew the pattern for covenant keeping it. They understood the promise of the Messiah. They knew the scriptures that foretold of his coming. So they had all the tools and everything needed to understand. These are people, if you were a Pharisee, if you were a scribe, you would have to be called those things, to be titled those things, would be to have been an expert, not just in the word and the knowledge of the Lord, but the law of God. They would have held the scepter in their hand, but they could not recognize God or listen, they refused to recognize God when Paul and Silas came on the scene to evangelize this place where a crowd had already gathered. This wasn't a city that didn't have a representation of God. It was a city that had not only a representation of God, but all of these other idols going forth in the midst of them. When I showed you the image earlier, you saw the image of, um, you know, all of the social media, all of the, uh, the, the street and the buildings behind um, the, the modern day Paul. And I want you to consider all of that from the place of distraction. We have so many voices and so many things coming for us. We are still, listen to me and hear me. We are still in the midst of Ampho Amphipolis, Apollonia, and Thessalonica. We are still in the midst of these places today. When we look around at the state of our congregation and the state of the church that we all believe that we are a part of. So verse six, well, no, I'm gonna go back to verse five real quick. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob 
and set all city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So Jason is where, Jason's house is where everybody's meeting. But I want you to see how what's happening among the Jewish people. They're jealous. They're offended of the influence of Paul and Silas. They're jealous of the message that they're bringing. They're offended that the crowd is coming to hear them. They're upset that they're drawing people away from their teaching. There's a whole competition taking place in the midst. And what are they doing? Looking to kill them in this city where the gospel of Jesus Christ is needed most. There's a desperation in our city right now. There's a hunger and a thirst in our cities now. And I want you to know that you are a city. You are a whole temple. You are a place of existing, a, a dwelling place made for God. Uh, you've got to realize that there's no excuse for us not to have fire unless, listen, or be developing our fire or becoming that place of, of being sold out and stable again if God has sent people to begin releasing a pure gospel to us where it has been tainted in a crowded world. And we have allowed the entrance of all these different types to come in and wear away at our trust and our belief. Remember the scripture tells us if the, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So if you're on the low end of the meter, you're on the low end of that passage of scripture. And I encourage you to read all of it because that scripture is not about um, anything but the but David saying to us profoundly, listen, I got to trust them. I got to believe that every word is true. I've got to trust the foundations that have been taught to me. That doesn't go away because we have the covenant of Jesus. It's intensified even more because we have more. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying there is another king and his name is Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So I want you to see the level of persecution here. I want you to see everything going on and happening in this city. I'm moving through because I want to get us to a verse. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away for the night to Berea and they arrived. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they received the word with our readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And we know that that scripture is said here. I'm going to read it from, um, well, we already know that scripture. No need to reread it. But there's verse 12. It says, therefore, many, many of them believe and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent men and women as well. But when the Jews from Thessalonica returned, Thessalonica returned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea and they came there also and stirred the crowds. They immediately, the brethren sent Paul away to go to sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. But those who conducted Paul, who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving command for Silas and Timothy to come with him with all speed, they departed. But listen to this. Now, while Paul uh, waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. And this is where our issue begins with church modification. It is clear, and I'm going to define that term for you. But what I want you to know is this. There are a lot of influences around us. And when our church, our, our, our idea of church is built on what men have created, we get mass confusion all around us, especially when we ourselves are not in pursuit 
hot pursuit, when we ourselves are not doing the first works assigned to us, when we are not learning of God, when we have chosen day by day by day to just exist and to be and not look, seek to be on fire. I have to say to you, if you are a low burn or a slow burn, listen, that's a choice you've made. Is not respective of anything happening around you. I need to see if you're hearing that statement. Go in the chat and, and say, I understand. Because one of the things we love, and we learned this last week, we elude truth. We make it about everything happening. I don't go there because of this, or I don't do that. We've all done it. But I want you to really understand that the, the, the choice to be on fire is in your hands. And the reason why we're seeing all of these houses that man have built fall down is because guess what? We've learned that we've built our houses with human hands. Let's keep going. So Paul is being accused of all kinds of things. And when I study, we don't, we're not going through this today, but when you study, and when I study, I want to challenge you. When you see something unfamiliar, you see something you don't, don't quite understand, you need to start asking questions of the Spirit, of Holy Spirit. And you also need to start asking questions. We're still on the previous slide. We need to start asking questions about what are these people groups? What are these mentions here. You need to be looking up Apollonia. You need to be looking at Athens. You need to be, listen, that's what I'm telling you. A true student of the word will study these things because in verse 18, we hear then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? I want you to see that they're seeing him as a troublemaker, as a babbler, a person spewing nonsense. But at the same time, I want you to look at how many gods are in this city. The Epicureans had a very specific belief system, which is gonna be very relevant to where we go next week. I'm not gonna tell you what that is, but I do want you to study. The Stoics had a very specific philosophy. I need you to study that. I also want you to go back and consider these different cities and the gods that were hosted in those cities. And this is the question that I'm bringing before you now. Listen, I want you to ask yourself, are all these gods still present in the church today? And am I worshiping them? Because listen, I'm here to tell you every single God that Paul confronted is operating in God's people when they are not on fire. When they're not on a path of moving from that number one, when I asked you the question at the beginning and getting to that place of being a five. Every one of those gods is battling for their attention on social media. Every one of those gods is battling for their attention in their own private lives as they choose to binge Netflix and stars and other shows over binging the word of God. All of those gods are gaining entrance by the choices we make every single day. And I want you to see Paul as a man in the center of a city that refuses to know its own God. We can look at the Jews mentioned here as people brought up in the faith that should recognize the, that recognize the God of all. But listen, when you go back and look at their responses, they are more concerned with status influence what Paul is doing. They represent the church today in many pastoral and apostolic types. They're more concerned with the institution that they are preserving, the system that they are building than they are with anything that brings total freedom to their nefesh. 
Are you seeing how these things are relating now? I know I shared a lot of information and I carried you all over the place with this, but I want you to look at the center of the city where Paul is. So we're down right now to a couple of more scriptures and then our main scripture. The scripture says here, um, this is verse 18, part B, it says, Others were saying this about Paul and Silas and all the others that were believing and now following. He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Interesting, they said foreign gods, even though Paul only talked about one. <laughs> I mean, he just talked about Jesus. And listen, again, back to that statement, he said, the gospel that I preached to you was Jesus the gospel I preach to you. And he made sure that they understood without a shadow of a doubt that they talked about who Jesus was and the power that came in the resurrection. We're going to go through line by line what the gospel is defined by the Bible, defined by the scriptures, so that you're not going to um, be left with that. We'll do that Tuesday night. Part of that Tuesday night, we're just gonna take a closer look so that we won't have to do that Saturday. But I want you to consider, do you really know what the gospel is? Because I'm, I'm telling you, what I'm sharing with you is not just me. It's not just you, it's all of us. We listen, we're in such a, a, a place of turning. Each and every one of us must stand in the mirror every day because we have so much social media influence. So many voices in our ears, so many opportunities to binge, so much politics to get caught up in. And when I say politics, I mean the kind that cause you to consider these things outside of God. Oh, we always have to be concerned about our rulers. We always have to be concerned about the nation where we are planted in and its leaders. So, but we're talking about something different when it's not our thought processes are not reflective, listen, of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Are you saved? But for a better question is, am I saved unto the kingdom of God or am I saved unto an institution? the work of men, the hands of people. Am I false? Do I have an illusion or a form of God in me? Because I'm here to challenge you today. I think many of us do. I think many of us do. Let's go on, let's look. For all the Athenians and the foreigners, verse 21, who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear of some new thing. Does that sound like the church today? Well, this is the next wave. When did we start looking for waves? When did we start looking for the next best catchphrase from prophets? When did we start looking and searching, listen, for those kinds of psychic prediction? When do we exchange the truth of God for a lie? When did we enter back into, or did we ever leave, this metropolis of religions, this convergence of cities? Because as you read Acts 17, and we'll revisit it again and go further and further into what's revealed here, you're going to see real quick that the very Jews who were supposedly um, devout, listen, were the main ones trying to merge and bring the world into the kingdom. I'm telling you. And we're wondering why pastors have fallen. The Bible says that if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I wanna keep reiterating to you, when you read that passage of scripture from Psalms and context, it's not talking about just what you're teaching. It's talking about your own trust, your individual place of building out your salvation in your own lives. David was 
asking, do I still trust God? I cannot let my foundations be destroyed. Yes, Saul is trying to kill me. Yes, this is going on. Yes, I've done X and I've done Y and I've done C, but my foundation. If we're looking at a scale from one to five and we find ourselves fair to middling, that's a great big gap and a great big hole. I can answer that for myself. There can be no holes in us. We have to, that's that place of being lukewarm that we've been talking about for the last month. We have to look in the mirror and ask God, God, can you tell me if I am saved? I feel like I'm saved, which is a whole lie. I think I'm saved, but what are you saved on? Are you saved on ideas from the institution and from systems? Or are you saved from the truth of God's word? That is where we're at. Because I'm here to tell you, I believe I was born again when I was born again. I know I was born again, but somewhere along the line, some of us didn't have our foundation shored up. Are you willing to admit that? Because if you can, God can work with that. And he can turn it around. Paul wasn't just out preaching the gospel to people. Silas wasn't just walking beside him. Timothy didn't stay back just to be hanging out and seeing where they could meet the next meeting. Jason risked his life to host them and they drug Jason out of his house and probably would have killed him. And I tell you, a one to a three aren't living like Jason. How are we moving to a five? That's just a, a, an expression. There's no number, no measurement for where you are. There's just this knowing that you need to move further and you need to move closer because true assurance makes you hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. It doesn't wane. It makes you more desperate. It causes you to fight. I can tell you, there's nothing worse than losing your fight. And I hope some of you can say, I can attest to that, Apostle Teresa. There's nothing worse than losing your fight because when you lose your fight, the question is not, God help me, what am I looking at? What am I focusing on? What have I turned my eyes to? What am I thinking? What am I processing? What am I idolizing? What am I placing before God that's so heavy and so big that it's blocked my entire view of God's word? Listen, we're talking about why are all these pastors falling? They have whole mega church, millions of dollars hundreds and thousands of people following them. 1.7 million followers on TikTok. One of the oldest people in the faith, one of the strongest ministers we know, Tony Evans. I'm stepping down. What is that? I'm sharing with you that somewhere along the line, somebody had loose screws and are no tent pegs at all in their foundation. They were not fitted to the cornerstone. That I mean, we have to have sober conversations about these things. Well, I fell. I did this last night. Well, there's something in your foundation that needs to be shored up. Second Timothy three, Second Timothy four, three through four it says this: For the time will come when people Hold on, let me get that right. When people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. This is not new, it's ancient. And listen, these strongholds are ancient. But guess what? God is ancient of days. And we have to figure out how to anchor to that point 
and how to live in the reality of 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. And we have to be able to look at this pattern that we're seeing in Acts 17. And you have to realize that the churches of today, many of the institutions and systems of today look just like this situation playing out in Acts 17. Jews trying to kill the people who are talking about the Messiah that the Jews prophesy. Isn't that crazy? And they're getting upset about it because they don't want the gospel preached even though the gospel does not contradict the single thing in the old covenant. Not a single thing. What they're angry and offended about is that they didn't get the revelation and that is coming from the Gentile side. They're offended that crowds are being drawn that they, that they're away from what they're trying to do. We're going to go to the next slide. We're going to go to the next slide. Today we're building, I want to give you just a um, overview of where we're going. I didn't read this passage, but I'll read it now. It's 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 18. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, and I want you to see that being saved, being saved, I, we've taught on this before in the conservatory, but every day is a state of being. We're constantly, constantly, constantly being saved unto God in our decision-making and our choices. So if you're not making the right choices, you're, you're becoming undone. I think a word that was used um, over the last five weeks is we're becoming depraved. We're going back to our reptilian brain. We're moving back to that state of mind. The further we stay from God, not God stays far from us because he's not. God is with us when we draw near to him. But if we reject him, he rejects us. We can't enter any other way than the way that's been laid out for us. There's just no other options. We can't come up with our own pathway to God, but you can if you're in all of these other religions and all of these other groups that we're going to clearly be able to identify, identify at the end of this teaching. I'm gonna walk you through universalism. We're gonna walk through, and I want you to see it. We're gonna walk through some of these popular doctrines because listen, these doctrines are slick, but God can clarify and cause you to be clear. He can. He does and he will, and he's proven it over and over again through his word, but you can't do it your way. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and finish this chapter because I need to get to this one scripture and we're going to revisit it later. Then Paul, we, we said that we're going to do verse 22 again. Then Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus Aero and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. I want you to see this so we know religion is not just for the church. I want you to hear he's speaking to a whole pagan, Christian mixed, he's, he's speaking to everybody. As I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing I am here, here to proclaim him to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with human hands. I'm going to ask you to write this phrase in scripture. We're not gonna define it today, but I want you to write this phrase that it is in scripture, but I want you to put it in the chat with me right now. And I want you to just consider it not made with human hands. Just that part, not made with human hands. I want you to meditate there for a minute. And just remember, God cannot dwell in temples made with human hands. Put that in the chat. I'm asking you to do that. I'm going to pause until I see it. Thank you. God cannot dwell in temples made with human hands. I know it's easy to go straight to a denomination, straight to a church or a pastor we don't like, straight to a place, any of the churches in the book of Revelations and make judgments. 
<laughs> you know, but I want you to know that in the midst of all of those places, God was making a last stand. He was coming for his people and then giving them look. That was the last stand. He was like, but it was a judgment and an ultimatum taking place. And when you hear the word, we have to recognize that, oh my God, in this moment, my house, my temple, my tabernacle is being judged. And I want you to walk away from that, from that, from this message today in front of your mirror, asking yourself, am I saved? Why am I hearing this message? I feel like I'm okay. Sometimes we feel okay if we're institutionalized, locked up, behind walls. It's a whole institution. It's a whole system at work. What kind of system can you be in when you think your pastor is God? And you think your whole service unto your pastor in the Levitical model that we still practice is equivalent to you being saved. What happens when you think you can't lunch out on things God told you to do without permission? I'm just knocking some things in there so you can see the, the system. We're going to walk through it. Who told you that you're saved when you don't go to the nightclub? Just not attending is all it, all it takes for you to think you're born again. Oh my goodness. Those things are not enough. They're outward behaviors that don't equate to inward transformation. They are one has nothing to do with the other until the inward transformation causes the outward behavior to change. Which brings me back to these fallen pastors. These, and when I say fallen pastors, I'm talking these child molesters. I'm talking these adulterers. I'm talking these people who pillage your pocketbook, who talk to you like a dog, yet you lay, lay at their feet. I'm talking all of that. And when people are found out, they want to scream and holler and say, God told me to go sit down. But no, he didn't. You got caught. And now you want an excuse to hide. And you're looking for a safe place to do it. But that thing happened 30 years ago, but you kept it a secret for 30 years. I hope you all are following me. And that we're able to walk through this. Because temples made with human hands are nothing more than the systems, the ideals, the thought processes, the walls that we encase ourselves in and we put God's name on it. And we justify ourselves strongly by those things that we have created. God cannot dwell in temples made with human hands. He cannot. Wow, I'm at the end. I'm really having to stop. I'm gonna do five more minutes and we're gonna pick up because I can't really stay on that point anymore. But I think you're getting what I'm saying here. This is gonna be a slow move, but there is a high place in it. I promise you. Real quick, I wanna look at um, this particular slide. Hold on. So on the left is this image of this um, modern day Paul in this city. And he's standing there. Now he's standing there from the place of the righteous, a righteous, righteous place. He's not standing there as a compromised believer. He's there because he's declaring these things. First John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world. Do not love the world of sin that opposes God, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual cravings of the flesh and the lust of the longing of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, these things do not come from the Father. I chose the Amplified Version because I like this version's definition of these things to keep me from defining it. And it says, but are from the world. The world is passing away and with it, it's lust. But the one who does the will of God carries out his purpose and carries out his purpose lives forever. Mm. 
Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to the world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. That right there is not enough, but I'm going to read the rest of this so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Those ethics and values need to be considered this way, what is ethical and valuable to God. Not in a philosophical, intellectual conversation. And this is where the law comes in. This is where the prophets come in. This is where the gospels come in. This is where the Sermon on the Mount comes in. This is where knowing the nature of God comes in. This is where knowing the nature of Jesus comes in. Ephesians 2, I mean being acquainted personally so to the point where it transforms you. Ephesians 2 and 2, in which you were once disliked, you were following the course and the fashion of this world, were under the sway of the tendency of the present age, following the, the prince of the power of the air, you were obedient and under the control of the human spirit and still and um, that still constantly works and the sons of disobedience. I want you to hear that. So the systems that we saw revealed to us in Acts 17, this is what is happening in those systems. Remember, those systems are not renewed. Those institutions, the hands, the things that men build with their hands. So on one side, you're seeing all of these things that the unrenewed are building. Then you're seeing all the things that the once renewed, now departed, are revealing. And now you're seeing what, what the people who are hot, those that are following God, are revealing. And you're seeing all these places at war. But you're also seeing one simple truth. This is the gospel that I have preached to you, which is what Paul has said. You have to figure out what type of gospel has been preached to you. I'm telling you, we all have to do it. And then what have I heard and how have I responded? Have I agreed with that gospel? And then it began to grow and became full grown. Have I agreed or can I interrupt it? And I'm willing to interrupt it and turn away because when you begin to look at the background of this modern day Paul in this image, you're able to see a lot of things going on, a lot of voices, a lot of choices, a lot of opportunities, but there's only one choice for us and that is Jesus Christ. But we must begin to see the church through the eyes of this situation in the book of Acts because a lot of it looks like this and is not representative of Jesus at all. And we're wondering why our foundations are unraveling. And they're unraveling because we were never really rooted <laughs> in the truth of God, the gospel message. We've gotten everything else. I'm gonna give you a definition. I'm gonna read Colossians 2 and 8, and then I'm gonna give you a definition, then I have to stop. Colossians 2 and 8, it says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, pseudoscience. Look up the word pseudoscience. I was just amazed that they had that word here. According to tradition and musing. Why is this important? Well, let me tell you. In Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 17, what's happening in the midst of all these people is that they're mixing the faith with these debates and these conversations. But listen, there's no voice of truth coming forth in the midst of these conversations. So what happens is you have an exchange of knowledge an exchange of understanding and then people go home and they think about it and they adopt these ideas that are contrary to everything that the Bible teaches. So you have Paul and you have Silas and you have those that they raise up and they're like, wait a minute. You might be thought leaders. This might be the place that you congregate. This might be your Solomon's porch. This might be your Apollonia, your Athens. But if you enter these places, 
You have to enter with what I said. This is the gospel that we preach. And your conversation has to be conversation, listen, that is persuading people toward the only one that can transform them. What has happened to us in the body of Christ today is that we have moved in this place of teaching and convincing people of such how can I say it, of such a mixture of all of these different types of doctrine that it sounds like God when in fact it is the doctrine of devils. It is the gospel of the Epicureans, the Stoics. It is the gospel of the Hellenists, the gospel of the Herodians, the gospel of the Ites where we reason with men and we build vain philosophies instead of building the kingdom of God. One more definition. What is church modification? Church modification can be understood as the attempt to adjust or reform religious practices, particularly, listen to me, the gospel of Jesus Christ and structures without addressing the core of what those practices represent. Conservatory, we're getting back on track. I'm, I'm gonna say this again, what is church modification? It's teaching around the rose bush but without ever teaching about the petals on the road. It's philosophy, it's intellectual, it's Gnosticism, it's Epicurean beliefs, it's universalism, it's your winning season. It's all of these things that we acclimate and it changes our mind to a point that we only have an appetite for those kinds of things. We only want the apple, the grapes, the peach, the mango. We only want that. We don't want what God wants because it takes us away from all of the things that, that our soul, that our reptilian brain, that sensual, listen, the Epicureans were all about sensuality. That's why I want you to study. What makes you feel good? What makes you think you're okay? This is what Paul, listen, this is why Jason got thrown out of his house. This is why they went and brought Paul to the pagan leaders in that city. Oh my God. There's a scripture in the gospels and it says that it, it, it's in Matthew particularly, but it talks about how the, the Jews are, were, were killing people <laughs> between the porch and the altar, killing their own people simply because their people decided to singularly follow Jesus Christ. They didn't like the language. They didn't like hearing about death, hell, and the grave. They didn't like being told that you are a sinner. They didn't like being told, hey, you might not be saved. They did not. When all of these things are yet written in the word, taught directly out of the mouth of Jesus. They didn't like being in Berea in, in Acts 17 and being told that you need to study the word of God. They wanted to go and study the message by this pastor. They wanted to go and study the message by that pastor. And you know, if that is like Paul said, if it's Apollos or Paul, that's okay in that sense, only because they're teaching what? The message of the gospel, but you still got to do the work. You still, <laughs> listen, you can't skip the work because somebody around you is teaching you the right thing. Let's go on to the next. I want to see this. I want to think the next slide has the scripture written out. You can take a screenshot. Well, not the scripture, but this passage. Church modification can be understood as the attempt to adjust or reform Christianity. I'll say Christianity from the perspective of believing in Jesus Christ, um, following the way of Christ, teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and structures without addressing the core of what those practices represent. 
In the context of Acts 17, the Athenians had a form of religion that was highly intellectual and ritualistic, but they lacked the power to truly transform lives. Their numerous altars and idols, including the inscribed to the unknown God, demonstrate a religious system, an institution where men were adding new deities and new practices to their lives daily. I challenge you today. Are we not doing that in our churches? Oh my God, the seven mountains. <laughs> oh my God, the courts of heaven. Every year there's something new and we're not examining it. And we're taking it on. And we're building houses around it with our own hand. We're mapping devils and demons. We're telling people, I heard a prophet that I know say, the word is alive and in you. You don't need the Bible anymore. If Jesus wanted us to have another Bible, he would add the apostles write one. Listen, crazy. I'm telling you things that I've heard and things that I've seen. You can have sex outside of marriage. Of course you can. Many things are permissible in that sense, but not all things are holy and righteous and represent our Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings. What decisions, what choices are you making that are outright unlawful? How offended are you with God that has caused you to stray into these other places? Oh my goodness. I'm gonna show you this, this, this slide, next slide, and then we're, we're completely stopping, I promise you. I just want you to see that image right there on the left. I just want you to take a look at that image. And I want you to remember that image because I have some good images in this teaching that I want us to talk about. There's a milk bottle for everybody. There's something for everyone to drink and i'm gonna leave you just with this we don't have to turn to another slide we'll pick up later it says first corinthians 3 12 through 15. now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold or silver or precious stones wood hay or straw each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test which one's work or what sort it is. Why am I bringing this up to you in this moment right now? Because it's not just that people are, are stepping away or that these leaders are falling. Look, fire is revealing the condition of their nefesh. Why? Because God is not going to continue and never has, but he's not going to let his people be deceived, especially when their worship is that leader or that pastor. Especially when they already have another God. We, we have to decide, we have to make a decision. We really have to make a decision. Some of you on here think you don't. And that's what's so sad about this whole conversation is that we don't think we're in the midst of decision, but every day we're in the midst of decision and you don't even realize it. And I'm hoping that we'll see how easy it is to think that we're following God. And when we're really truthful with ourselves and we're really ready to face the truth, when you discover that you've been following, listen, the work of your own hand your own hands when we really need to be led by the hand of God because God is serious. He cannot dwell in temples made with human hands. Ponder on why David could not build the temple for God. There was a reason. David's hands, they had so much blood. Even though God said David was after his own heart, but there were so many turns in the midst of that that it cost David. 
Listen, God, there's nothing without consequence. Nothing. Some of us are making decisions now. And listen, we don't even know what the consequence will be. But we just have to brace and make sure our foundation is shored up because no one escapes consequence. God's forgiveness and our repentance does not mean there are no consequences. You do lose something. We do miss things that, listen, we cannot get back. But the mercy of God puts us back on track and helps us, we can't go back and get what we lost, but we can move forward into greater glory, greater truth, a new path that's all about Jesus and nothing else. How are we going to get there? Decision, 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 decision. It's not God's fault that we're at a one or a three. All of that is in our hands. All of it is in our hands. Just remember, God cannot dwell in temples made with human hands. He makes us, but he can't do it if we're not participating. Father, we just thank you for the message on today. I thank you for the first step into this message. I thank you, Father, for ears that we're able to follow. I thank you, Father, for the charge for them to begin to observe the world around them more accurately. I pray, Father, that they have the, the tenacity of Ezekiel to dig into the walls, God, to dig that hole so deep that they can see the abominations that are happening inside the church today and that they can ask the question, am I in this? Am I taking part? Am I partaking and I'm receiving a libation? Am I, what, what am I doing? Am I sipping an offering to a foreign God? Father, is this me? Am I in this house instead of being in your house? What have I compromised? What have I given up so I could fit in? What have I accepted so I can have the influence of this leader or that leader? How have I compromised my very soul? What have I done so that I can get a leg up, so that I can manipulate and get what I want? What have I contributed to in this conversation in this city of Acts 17 that disqualifies me from my kingship. Lord, you declare to us all the time that we have to be worthy, show ourselves worthy, show ourselves approved. So over and over and over again, Lord, let your people hear concerning themselves. Let them study Acts 17 and really realize what's happening right up under our noses at severe levels at severe levels in Jesus name. It begins with us. Amen and amen and amen.